Hi, I'm Peter Major, this year's chair of the IEEE Boston Computer Society chapter and program chair of this seminar series, which is jointly sponsored by the IEEE Computer Society chapter and the Greater Boston chapter of the ACM. We put on a curated talk about 10 months of the year, usually starting at 7 p.m. on the third Thursday of the month and are still meeting virtually because of the uh, residual caution about the COVID-19 pandemic. You can see abstracts of past talks and information about future ones by looking at our websites, www.gbcacm.org and ewhieeeorg slash r1 slash boston slash computer. When the recordings of this and other talks become available, we will also post the links there. Tonight's speaker is Gerald J. Sussman, the Panasonic, formerly Matsushita, Professor of Electrical Engineering at MIT. Jerry is best known as the co-author of, co of the Structured Interpretation book that was the basis for introductory computer science courses at MIT from 1984 to 2007. These courses were emulated throughout the world with over a hundred colleges, universities, and high schools using the Structured Interpretation book for instruction as of 1999. The book went through two editions, was translated into French, German, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Polish, and is now available to download free under a Creative Commons license. Since then, Jerry and others, principally Jack Wisdom and Hal Abelson, adopted and extended these concepts to apply them to exploring classical mechanics and differential geometry, wrote two books on the subject, and used them as the basis for several MIT courses. Gary and Chris Hodson published a book on software design for flexibility in 2021 that extends these ideas and applies them to some additional languages. More recently, Martin Hens and Tobias Rigstad wrote a book that explains how to apply these concepts to JavaScript, something that Martin had been using to teach at the uh, University of Singapore for several years. So here's Jerry to tell you what this is all about and how it's been a lot of fun to do. Everybody, um, I'm a little disturbed about the fact that I can't be there with you. I love to talk to students directly and uh, see their faces. And that uh, is a little bit of a, a difficulty using this, this medium. Uh, but, uh, but in fact, I suppose that's what we're stuck with now since the, the invention of this nasty virus called COVID which has changed the world in ways that I'm not happy about. Anyway, let's get started. I'm going to uh, connect, uh, grab my, the screen and show you my slides. Let me do that. Okay, so uh, this will fix itself in a second. It's, um, okay, does everybody see that slide? Just wanna check. Does people see it? Peter, do you see the slide? I see the slide. Oh, good, okay, good. So anyway, I've been programming computers for an enormously long time. I suppose- Jer been... Jerry, what, what bright thing, can you adjust the volume on your computer? So yes. it's, lots of people are complaining. Oh, is it too loud? No, it's not loud enough. Oh, okay, let me figure this out. Sound settings, because uh, I talk loud, that's one of the problems. Okay, is this better? How's that? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I've just, I'm now going to, uh, yeah, I can make it whatever it is. Let me put it back to, there it is. Okay, fine. Okay, so I'm in computer, programming computers since about 1962. Uh, what happened was I was a member of the Columbia Science Honors Program, as were well, many others in, who lived in New York, Brooklyn, New York. And at that time, computers looked sort of like this, Okay. Uh, this particular one is from NASA Mission Control, but uh, it's an IBM 7090 system. Uh, MIT had two of these. There are 7094s actually, and Columbia had one. Uh, and uh, what, you know, this machine, just to give you a feeling for it, cost multiple millions of dollars, probably on the order of 15 million. It could address. Jerry, one more th second. Now someone is complaining that the microphone phone gate is too loud. Oh, I'll bring it down again. 
Okay, sorry. Too much, just a little bit. Okay. Yes, this is one of the problems with this business is I can't adjust based on seeing what your, your eyes and your faces. Good. Okay, is that better? Okay, so the, this, it can, this machine can address uh, two to the 15th words, 32, 768, each of which had about 36 bits of memory, a uh, uh, 36 bit word. So that's less than a megabyte. Uh, it ran about two microseconds per cycle, it was 500 kilohertz. And the, ad the ad instruction word had an address part of uh, 15 bits, a decrement part of 15 bits, from which we get the names car and cutter in, in Lisp. Car is the contents of the address part of the register, and cutter is the contents of the de decrement part of the register, just for a little bit of history. Uh, although the machines that we I began to use at, at uh, Columbia at the beginning in 1962 were much smaller machines, they were 650s and 1620s. When I got to MIT, I uh, immediately fell in with Marvin Minsky, and uh, just to give you a feeling, that's where, what I looked like then, okay? <laughs> Uh, there's a, you're looking at the uh, PDP-6 uh, in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, uh, approximately 1964, uh, maybe 65. And here's, um, actually, it may be a little later, because this, this thing is the, uh, is the fact that the machine won a, a chess game in a, tour, in a tournament. So it must be after uh, Greenblatt wrote his chess program. But for those of you who don't, uh, haven't seen a dial telephone, uh, what you're seeing there is a, uh, is a 500 set. And it had the telephone number, which is the MIT extension 6765. When uh, Bill Gosper answered the phone, he would say Fibonacci of 20, okay, which was a, a th that's because that equals 6765. Give my pages here. Okay. Now, this machine costs less than a million bucks, uh, but it can address two to the 18th 36 bit words. That's a little bit more than one megabyte. We needed big memories at the time to do things like Maxima, which is the first symbolic manipulator of any good quality. We contracted to a company called Fabrotech to make, to make that memory. Uh, it took one year to make it. Okay. We, okay it cost, it cost 380,000 US dollars in 1967. And it was named the Moby after the Moby Dick, since it was considered to be an enormous amount of memory at that time, one megabyte. Okay, uh, this machine also it was uh, approximately that speed of you know something like a couple hundred kilohertz. Mm. Since then, I've learned a great deal about computing. I've also designed and built lots of circuits. I've worked in artificial intelligence. I've been involved in the design of some novel computers. I've participated in the invention of computer languages. I've done numerical simulations for celestial mechanics, and I've written large symbolic systems. But I've never given up programming because I love programming. And that's because programming is fun. So that's what I want to talk about today, okay? With that introduction. <clears throat> well, what is programming? Programming is sort of a uh, somewhat but mysterious idea. Uh, it certainly is not coding, okay? It is not the mechanical transformation of well-defined specifications into executable code. We build compilers to do that. Part of the problem is that there's usually no good specification to meet. We, in some deep sense, we don't know what we want to build when we're building it, okay? And that's for a big good reason. It's extremely difficult to specify stuff, okay? For example, how could I possibly specify that I want a program that plays good chess? I can specify that it plays legal chess, okay? But good chess, how do you, how do, you do that? Can't really say that, okay? Or uh, things like, how would you specify something like Microsoft Word, okay? You have no idea what, it, you, have no idea what, it's, what it's, you want it to do. You want it to do something reasonable at every situation, which Microsoft Word doesn't, but that's a separate issue. So, so the specification is not at all clear what it is. In fact, good specifications are almost never from the boss. Our job as programmers is to figure out what we can do, and then we write specifications for what we will be able to accomplish. I want to think of it that way, okay? We basically understand what constraints there are we have on what is feasible to implement in a reasonable amount of time. And so what we do is we explore the space of implementable techniques to discover the possibly attainable specifications. 
Having figured that out, we then write a program with those specifications if we're good at it, okay? Now, that means programming is very different from a lot of other subjects. It's abstract engineering design. We do a joint exploration of the achievable specifications and the possible implementations directed at some partially defined goal. And this is unlike other kinds of design in that there aren't physical limitations. Okay, there's nothing like, we don't have to worry about the tolerances of parts. Okay, we don't have to worry about whether or not there's, there's a supply chain to get the parts, okay? Our problem is entirely based on the control of complexity. Can we organize the ideas in our minds? Okay? And we have lots of choices we can make, of course, in doing this sort of thing, but it's, it's a very different kind of thing than say, uh, my electrical engineering type things when I build a circuit or mechanical engineering things, okay, in that way. So what's it really like? What does it feel like to be a programmer? Let's talk about that for a second. Okay. Well, one approach to that is to ask other experts. For example, one kind of expert, a poet is a kind of expert. Good poets have to construct mechanisms, say, in a sense, aesthetic mechanisms that produce particularly chosen uh, emotional states in their readers. That's what a poet likes to do. So there's a particularly famous one that was actually pretty articulate. I'm going to read this to you. Edgar Allan Poe wrote a, a paper on, about his construction of The Raven. You all, probably all know The Raven. It was a great poem. Okay, and it's of course intended to produce a, a feeling of loss because it's about the way a person feels when he's lost a loved one. I'm gonna read this to you. I select the Raven as most generally known. It is my design to render it manifest that at no one point in its composition is referable to either accident or intuition. That the work proceeded step-by-step step to its completion with the precision and rigid consequence of a mathematical problem. He goes on to, there's a lot more there, but here's the next paragraph that I thought was interesting. Most writers would positively shudder at letting the public take a peep behind the scenes, at the elaborate and vastly crudities of thought, at the true purposes seized only at the last moment, at the innumerable glimpses of an idea that arrived not at the maturity of full view, at the fully matured fancies discarded in despair as unmanageable as the cautious elections and rejections, at the painful erasures and interpolations, at the wheels and pinions, the tackle for scene shifting, the step ladders and demon traps, the cock's feathers, the red paint and black patches, which constitute the properties of a literary histrio. For those of you who don't know what histrio is, history is an actor. That's an old word for actor, okay? So isn't that what programming really feels like? Think about that for a second, okay? It certainly feels like that to me, okay? And, and therefore it puts it, programming is more like this. It's a creative art. It feels like designing a building or writing a piece of music or poetry, for example, or making a sculpture or a painting or literature. Or for me, things like that I'm better at. I'm not good at those things, but I, I like mathematics and theoretical physics. And it feels like that. We're building a pretty theorem or a, a, a nice theory of a physical phenomenon. Okay, that's, that's what it feels like. Okay. Now let's, let me get into this a little bit more, more clearly. Okay. I want to uh, talk to you again a little about history. When I was a freshman at MIT in 1964, okay, I was shown the programming language LISP. Okay, there was a list 1.5 programmer's manual, and there were other books, but ones by, for example, uh, Bobro and uh, uh, I suppose, it, what is it? Must have been, oh yeah, uh, Edmund C. Berkeley. Yes, I was looking at my notes here, uh, Edmund C. Berkeley. Anyway, one evening over a Chinese restaurant dinner with other Minsky's hackers, okay, that's the people who hung out in Minsky's lab. Someone, I think it might have been Bill Gosper, Explain the famous eval apply interpreter to me. Okay, that's the central thing that works and makes that makes Lisp run, and it's written in Lisp. Okay, 
And that was a revelation that changed my life. Okay? Here's the core of such an interpreter. It's not the one that was in the list point five programmers manual. It's written in scheme. Okay. But it, the only important thing to show you is not, is this is ugly. This is a particularly it's, it's a concrete syntax. It's got cars and cutters and it's, but it's basically dispatches on an appropriate, uh, a, a expression type and then it calls apply, which takes a procedure and arguments, which produces a new call to a val. Okay. That's basically the idea. Okay. And yeah, there are prettier ones like that. I mean, if you, if you, but the essential idea is this. Eval takes an expression and an environment. The environment is the, a mapping of the symbols that occur, the free variables in the expression, to meanings. It transforms that into a procedure and arguments. Okay, the arguments are going to be passed to the procedure, and the then apply takes the arguments, binds the formal parameters of the procedure to the arguments, and then avows the body of the procedure. That's how it works. Okay. Now, you know, there are prettier versions of, of eval apply interpreters. You can see it in my books, like Instructor Interpretation of Computer Programs. We have very elegant abstract syntax. And in uh, software design flexibility, we make it even extensible in ways that are amazing, where you can do all sorts of things that you wouldn't have expected otherwise. But the thing that hit me when I was uh, that freshman year and uh, I was shown things like this is I began to understand the thing that I write below. The computer revolution is revolution in the way we think and the way we express the thing, what we think. That's the first step. But the, also the structure of the eval apply interpreter is almost a mystical experience. Okay. Now I don't believe in mysticism much, but mystical, but it's fun to use mystical symbols. Okay. To, to represent the sort of wonder and awe that you get out of having to be able to describe something that, that in such a simple way. Okay, how to make such a beautiful description in such a simple form. Okay, now I'm going to go back and say a little more about my freshman year. Okay, because in the second term of my freshman year, let's see if I get back here. Yes, unfortunately, I have lots of paper notes. Good. Uh, I was taking the freshman physics class, okay, the 802. We were learning electricity and magnetism from the perspective of general, sorry, special relativity. And the high point in that class was the appearance of Maxwell's equations. Okay, there's Maxwell's equations. And it's a very, very simple set of, well, it's a simple set of linear partial differential equations. Rho is the source of, of electric fields. That's the charge density. J is current density. That's the source of magnetic fields. Uh, their magnetic fields have no beginning and end. They they just they just curl. And electric fields uh, have have can uh, start on charges. But the important thing here is that when you add conservation of charge, okay, this is a very powerful idea. Okay, what you're seeing is that rate of change of the electric field produces magnetic field. The rate of change of magnetic field produces electric field. Ooh. Okay. You can get the wave equation in two steps right there. Here's the wave equation. And you get propagation of waves that propagate at the speed of light. Okay. It's a very simple system from which we get a self-sustaining electromagnetic wave. Now, why did I bring this up? The reason I brought this up is because, okay, and I'm going to show you. It's because there's an analogy. Okay, this is a philosophical analogy, and it feels good to think about. Okay, just as eval turns eval turns expressions and environments into procedures and arguments, and procedures and arguments turn into eval eval turns them into expressions, and um, a, 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 sorry, the apply turns the procedure and arguments into an expression and an environment, and so it goes around and buzz. The same thing is going on here. The rate of change of, of B produces E. The rate of change of E produces B. Okay, This is a duality. And dualities occur all through the, the physical world and many other parts of the world, too. So, for example, we have position and momentum duality. A posi position, say, in an orbit of planets. Okay, 
the position of the of the particles determines the forces on them, which tells you how the momentum changes. The momentum tells by integration how the position changes. Whoa, duality, current and voltage, energy and time. All of these are standard dualities that are that are sort of very much like this idea. So here's a powerful source of emotional impact in programming. Okay. It is that you get to think about things that are that are are philosophically significant. Okay. And I mean this really because what's going on every time you're writing a program, you're encountering things that have bothered philosophers for thousands of years. You're writing a program that's got some database, for example, which is mapping, you know, that involves place, uh, places in the world. So you have, you have word Chicago appearing somewhere. Okay. What's that refer to? It's very hard to understand what it refers to. The city isn't in my computer. What's worse is the city is changing all the time. What does the symbol Chicago mean? Or even better, Jerry Sussman is a symbol, okay, in a computer perhaps, okay? I'm changing all the time. Furthermore, if I cut my fingernails today, I'm a different person than I was five seconds before that. What is, what is the constancy? In fact, what does it mean for things to be the same? Sameness is a, is a pretty interesting problem. What does it mean to be identical? We encounter this in programming all the time. We worry about, about aliasing, for example, of data structures. Two data structures are identical if only if, if, only if modifying one modifies the other. Okay? Mutation of a data structure is change in time. Pure functional programs have no mutation. That's pretty interesting. Okay? Yet you can compute with them. Okay? But the interesting thing I, I, I show my students when I talk about things like this is I take two pieces of chalk. Okay? I put them on the table and they're, you know, they look the same, okay? And I say to the students, is it possible that I'm fooling them, that I, I'm a good magician and I set up some mirrors in such a way that's really one piece of chalk, okay? But, but there's, but, but there's two, two images of it. How would you tell? And the answer is, if I break one of them, the other one doesn't break, okay? Therefore, there are two separate ones. The only meaning of identity has to do with change and mutation. And therefore, so that's pretty interesting. There's also things that, other things that philosophers have worried about, like what is the logical properties of a quoted expression? Here's a problem that's been bothering us. And every, again, every programmer encounters this all the time. Okay. John knows, quote, the morning star is Venus. We all know that the morning star is the evening star. Now, we were also taught in elementary school or something, you can always substitute equals for equals in an expression. But John doesn't necessarily know the evening star is Venus. He only knew the morning star is Venus. Okay? So we can't do that substitution and expect to get right answers. And then even more, re you know, another, this is probably more, more important now, in machine learning, this the Hempel's Ravens paradox. If something's raven is black, evidence for that is every time you see a black raven, okay, every see you see a black raven, that's evidence that ravens are black. But that's logically equivalent to if something is not black and is not a raven. But here's my here's my gray teacup okay, mug. Guess what? That seeing this doesn't give me any evidence that ravens are black. So evidence has very little to do with logical equivalence. And now I'm not trying to say that I'm solving these problems every day when I'm doing writing programming, but I'm thinking about them. It makes me think. It makes me think about things that are of, of eternal significance. And that is fun. Okay. Let's get to another kind of thing that could be fun. Okay. Bugs can be fun. Okay. And now, I suppose you, many of you were uh, given a hard time in your, by people saying that you should be ashamed to have a bug or something. There's these, this, there was a fellow, famous guy by the name of Dijkstra who basically said you should never program a computer until after you've proved that the thing you were going to 
you're going to write, the program you write was already true, correct. I disagree with that. Okay. Bugs are, first of all, have many properties. One is that an interesting bug is an opportunity to learn. And debugging with good tools is a, is a detective adventure. I believe that. And good bugs have names. We all know we have names for like fence post errors is a name for a bug. Okay. A reader writer bug is a good name. And we have to know these names because they have specific mitigation strategies for them when they come up. But I'm going to make a more powerful statement than this. Actually, bugs are a consequence of doing things right. Bugs are a consequence of design correctly, of, of design strategy, a design strategy that is real, okay, and that every smart person uses for everything they do. The crucial, crucial thing is that you can't consider everything at once. Minds are not big enough to solve to see everything that's going on. Planning requires making simplifications to achieve an approximate solution, which you then refine. So you, so you, you, because it's a simplification, there is something you didn't take into account. There are therefore bugs. Debugging refines the kind of design to become more what you wanted. Okay, this is a strategy I would call problem solving by debugging almost right plans. Psst, DARP. Okay, just give it a name. Okay, and I want to be a little more explicit about this. So I'm going to give you an example in terms of actually electrical circuits, which is one of the things I teach also. And you don't have to understand much about electrical circuits to understand what I'm about to show you. Don't think about the details. Please think about the thinking style. Okay, here. Supposing I need an electrical fil electronic filter with a frequency response that looks like this. Basically, an example of something that is at, at DC, no, there's no output. I got to turn around, say, at 30 hertz. Going to turn around again at, at, at 3 kilohertz, okay? Because I'm deal dealing with uh, passing only street speech waveforms. Actually, I can make that 100, 100 hertz speech waveforms. No, no, nothing anybody hears you know, when to listening to speech is, is less than 100 hertz. And telephones of the old kind never pass more than 3 kilohertz anyway. So I'm looking for a device that's going to have a, as we call it, a system function, which it, it has this behavior, frequency behavior. Now, this is hard to think about because, well, I already told you the story. The story is that there are three discrete things here. I've got, a, I've got an initial place, which is a zero, and I've got two turnarounds, okay, that turn clockwise in the graph. That's the same thing as saying I got poles and zeros in the frequency domain. Don't worry about it. All I'm doing is creating discrete features so I can think in terms of discrete ideas. Okay, You don't have to know why this is what I'm talking about. But it means that I've got a, a decomposition of my problem into parts, which is a ratio of polynomials. Okay. Something like that. This, is, this, this polynomial goes to infinity if the complex frequency happens to be B or A. At zero, at zero. That's all. Okay. Why there's complex numbers and all that? The good reason for complex numbers is because I'm avoiding doing sines and cosines and, and trig functions. I'd rather use exponentials, but don't worry about that. Okay. Let's talk about my strategy. I have various mental library, have various plans for how to make compound system functions out of pieces. For example, I can. I can make something which is the sum of two system functions by parallel input and serial output, okay, series output. Or for example, I can make a product, okay, by putting things in, I, I can compose the, the it compose a system function by cascading two pieces. Now that looks a lot like what I have over here. Gee, I have something which is a, a product. I could have turned it into a sum by, by partial fractions, but I'm not interested in talking about that plan right now. Okay, so I have a product. Well, it's got pieces. I happen to also have a, a library of how to make the parts. So for example, I can make something which is a single pole by picking out a, a resistor and a capacitor in this web form. Why this works, I'm not trying to explain this to you. I'm not teaching you electrical engineering right now, but I can make a pole. Okay. I can also make a zero at a particular frequency by picking appropriate, I can make a pole and a zero by picking out a capacitor and resistor and putting them in this pattern rather than this pattern. Okay. 
So let's say, supposing I thought I was doing, I was doing things right, and I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to hook them together. It doesn't work. It was a good plan, but it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, I've got a name for the bug. The problem is that when I specified these pieces, these were considered to be voltage dividers, meaning no current was being drawn out of this terminal or this terminal over here. But when I hook them together, this guy, the next guy, sucks current out of the previous one. So the bug is called a loading bug. This circuit is loading this circuit. That's all, just to be a name. I happen to have a mitigation strategy for this. Okay, I have many of them, but one, for example, such a mitigation strategy is to put an amplifier in. Okay, by supplying external power with an amplifier, I can get rid of my loading bug. This does work. Okay, so this is, I only showed you this because, I showed you this only because, I put the only in the wrong place, that's a bug. I showed you this only because I want you to get the idea of this planning strategy. Of course, we do this in programming all the time. We do it in building any kind of machine of any sort. We do it when we're, where we're, uh, when we're planning how we're going to go somewhere. Okay. I have a plan library with lots of plans. Each plan has an approximate solution. Each plan gives us a way of composing a stamp at the solution. There are named bugs associated with each plan. Factorization plan has a loading bug. The summation plan has a ground bug. Oh, that's because the the common wire, if it goes through on the bottom of, the, of that two port, okay, for those of you who are electrical engineers, okay, will short out what the, uh, the, the other thing it gets connected to. So, you know, and the iteration, iteration plans have fence both bugs we all know about. Concurrency plans may have reader writer bugs. And there are named patches for each bug in each plan. Loading bugs can be patched with an amplifier, but the amplifier patch is not appropriate if I want to make a passive filter. Okay, so I have, they may have other patches. And each bug patch may itself have bugs. Okay, so we're, you know, this is a, is a general strategy for how to play, but this is a way to organize your mind. And it's fun. Some bugs are not fun. Okay, there's what we call ugly kludges. Okay, and they detract from the pleasure of programming. Okay, they're tedious to debug. One particular one I hate a lot is, is language C. And especially C++, it has enormous numbers of traps for the un uh, unwary programmer. It sort of lures you into getting wrong answers. Okay, and I want to let's not let's ignore that. Let's do something more simple. Consider elementary like consider Python. Python's a language which has got lots of good ideas in it, like for example, um, generic sequences and things like that. But just look at this. Okay. If I ask, if I make a dictionary, I get something with the squiggly brackets. Okay, that's what it looks like. And the type of that is indeed a dictionary, as I'd expect. But if I put something in between those squiggly brackets, I get something called a set. Whoops. Okay, so maybe making a set is, a, is the same as making a dictionary? Probably not. If I make a set of an object foo, what do you think I get? Oh my gosh, I get the F and the O. But a set containing a singleton thing like that is itself. The guys who invented this language didn't make it consistent. Okay, the, the notation isn't, isn't sort of organized in a way that people were thinking clearly about how they put it together. I'll make it, make it even more clear. Here's another example, even worse. Here I have a list of two elements, foo and bar. The zeroth element of the list, that's the, the foo, is in fact correct. And the rest of the list is, is bar, okay? In a, in a, it's a list containing a bar, sure. And if I, and this all seems consistent. The list containing one element, foo, is foo, and the rest of it's the empty list. Good. Supposing I use tuples instead of lists. Well, the only difference between tuples and lists is I put in uh, round brackets, okay? Well, that looks okay. Uh-oh. This is not what I'd expect. Okay, <laughs> I expected the foo for that because that would be, be analogous to what goes on here. And I expected this to be the rest, but I get the OO. Anyway, I'm sorry to say that I get upset, really upset when I think like this. Okay, so that's, these are bugs that are not fun. Okay, but we have to put up with them. The world is imperfect.
anyway, I'm going to tell you something more. Okay. Let me get along here in this. Yes. Yeah. I have lots of notes I write. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about why, how programming makes it fun to discover things. In 1992, I spent a year at Caltech on sabbatical learning about general relativity. I hung out with Kip Thorne, who's the, you know, the other half of, of the LIGO project, the, first, the, well, the half at MIT was uh, Ray Weiss, who was, by the way, my undergraduate, uh, he was my freshman advisor, okay, and I took classes from him also. In fact, I got, my 802 was for, with him, the, uh, the A&M course, okay? Anyway, I uh, was hanging out with Kip Thorne, and I was also thinking about the programming and what I learned, because one of the ways I use programming is to remember things. I write things down the same way people write write textual descriptions, right? The way same way people write write uh, stories, okay, or 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 uh, papers. I use it for remembering my for for remembering stuff because it's very easy to get unambiguous results. There was a fellow by the name of Dan Zuris who had, I was friends with who uh, made floating point chips at Hewlett Packard, and he thought the he made the chips that we used in the digital orrery which I had made in the 80s for doing orbital mechanics calculations. And he visited me at Caltech when, and he, we started thinking about derivatives of functions, okay? That's not the same thing as derivative of expressions. For example, derivative of a function is something like this. The derivative of the function of one argument X, which cubes its argument, okay? When applied to two is 12. So the derivative is itself a new function, okay? That's, um, and I want to be careful that this is not the same thing as the derivative with respect to x, because x doesn't matter. Okay, this is the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. Okay, it's not the that as a function. Okay, the derivative of a function is a new function. What we want to, is a method that is neither numerical approximation nor a symbolic derivation, because what we want to do is preserve the opacity of the functional the function implementation, like x cubed could have been written different ways. It could be written as x times x times x. It could have been written as x times x square. Could have been written as, um, you know, as x to the fourth divided by x. All of those are mathematically equivalent, okay? But they're, but that, that means looking inside the, inside the expression that computes the, the, the function, not the function. And what we discovered, we were having fun, we discovered forward mode automatic differentiation, which was other people knew, but we were pretty ignorant. It's by the way, it's fun to do things. It's fun to rediscover stuff that other people do too. It's not like only the new things that are fun. So we, but we decided here's the insight. We saw the essential thing was the chain rule. The chain rule written in in traditional notation is this. I'm writing out correctly. Okay, the derivative of of f of g of x. This is an expression derivative, is the derivative of f of u with respect to u, where u gets g of x substituted for it, times the derivative with respect to x of g of x. Or more function, in a functional modern mathematical notation, like you see in Michael Spivak's wonderful book called Calculus on Manifolds, the derivative of f composed with g applied to x is the derivative of f applied to g of x times the derivative of g of x. At one point, Dan and I realized that if the number system were extended to have differential objects that combined a finite part and an infinitesimal part, composition would work automatically, okay? That is, if I took every function and made it so it could take a combination, just like a complex number that has two parts, this is the, the finite part and the infinitesimal part, and I transformed it like this to get a, the value of the function at the finite part plus the derivative of the function at the finite part multiplied by the infinitesimal part, then if I took that and put that through uh, the same kind of thing, if I go take a, such a, an object and put it through another function, I get the correct answer for the, kind of the chain rule. Ah, okay. So because we were using scheme, which is a lisp okay, that I like, I could redefine all the primitive arithmetic operators to work with our differential objects. By the way, those, dif those differential objects were 
invented by Clifford in the 19th century. They're called dual numbers, but we didn't know that. So Dan and I had a hack attack. Haven't you all had hack attacks? A hack attacks where you can't go to sleep. You stay up all night and, 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 and until you get the job done. Okay, by morning, we had my MIT GNU scheme system doing automatic differentiation with both unary and unary functions. Okay, and this was a preliminary plan, of course. It had bugs. Later, Hal Abelson helped work out the correct theory for multiple derivatives, and Siskin, and Perlmutter, and, and Radul have helped us in debugging the ideas of derivatives for higher order functions like this. Okay, but the idea you know, was a wonderful thing at that moment. It felt good, okay? And this, with the development of the efficient ways to extend the primitive operators, that's what Chris and I have been working on, okay? Uh, so that you could make, you could take the primitive operators and extend them without much cost, okay? I built this schema tool system, which Jack Wisdom and I have used for teaching and research in classical mechanics and differential geometry. The schema system is generically extended arithmetic to everything, you know, literal numbers, literals, that means, means things like, like symbolic vectors and covectors, matrices and more general structures, manifolds, vector fields, form fields, center fields, functions and operator series and units, and there's a lot more, okay? I didn't, just didn't have enough room to put on the slide. This is, a great, this is many years of work, and it was a great deal of fun, okay? For example, right now, it's just an easy thing to do, you know, for, you know, may not know what this means, but I take the Lie transform with respect to a Hamiltonian for a time t, incremental time t, and that's the exponentiation of t times a Lie derivative, okay, such that I can get the Lie derivative of transform, getting the Hamiltonian of a harmonic oscillator and look at the first, apply it to the coordinates and take a look at, this is how the, the first six terms of the, the coordinate expansion. Don't worry about that. You're not supposed to know, you can take my class in, 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 in classical mechanics. That's not the point. The point is this, when Dan Zeres and I came up with the idea that we could make differential objects that when passed through a function automatically implemented the chain rule, that felt good. And when that idea was coupled with the technique of generically extending the primitive arithmetic operations, I immediately knew this was a fruitful plan for a system. The fun was in the discovery of the plan and the subject, a subsequent multiple year elaboration of the system with Hal and Jack Wisdom. Okay, and indeed, Jack and I wrote two books about this. Okay, one is, one is a rather extensive book on modern classical mechanics done using a mixture of symbolic and, and uh, numerical methods that couldn't have been written except by doing something like this. And also I learned a lot about general relativity. That's why I wanted to learn about, I, I wanted to write a book about differential geometry. And what you're seeing here is in fact the, uh, uh, the path of light around two gravitating object, probably black holes. And you'll see there's a lambda here because lambda calculus is the basis of all that, that, uh, that software, okay? So that's the sort of thing that I get a fe good feeling about. Now, that's in fact, I'm gonna read to you this, this, this uh, little piece of why this is a good thing and why it was so much fun, okay? It's directed at using programming to obtain clarity. Classical mechanics is deceptively simple. Simple. It is surprisingly easy to get the right answer with fallacious reasoning or without real understanding. To address this problem, Jack and I use computational techniques to communicate a deeper understanding. Expressing the methods in a computer language forces them to be unambiguous and computationally effective. The task of formulating a method as a computer executable program and debugging that program is a powerful exercise in the learning process. And once formalized procedurally, the mathematical idea becomes a tool that can be used directly to compute results. So as you saw before, I'll give you an example of what I mean by transforming, trans getting clarity, getting clarity, because traditional books weren't so clear, okay? For example, a real, now here again, I'm not trying to teach you classical mechanics. I'm just gonna show you the idea of how th the thinking idea and why it's so much fun. The re a realizable path, that's the path that something can actually move through the configuration space of a dynamic system satisfies Lagrange equations. Lagrange equations are basically Newton's equations, okay? 
that's F equals MA, but done in a much more general way. In traditional notation, Lagrange equations are written like this. If you look at a book of classical mechanics, you see things like this. This mathematical description is vague. What are we trying to do? Okay, remember that what these equations are intended to tell you is, is the particular path one that could actually happen? So you have to have the path. The path is not even here. Okay, it's not explicitly specified. Okay, and there's a type error. How do I take a derivative of something with respect to a single time variable of a, of a function called Lagrangian, which takes three arguments, the time, position, and, and velocity? Okay, it's not clear. What's really going on is something that's understood by context. And unfortunately, context is something you have to have a lot of knowledge about in order to, to be able to read this. So when you teach this with students, then they don't know what you're, the context, they, it's, they have a great hard time. So here's the more correct answer. I take the der partial derivative of L with respect to the velocities, okay? Substitute in for the positions and velocities, the path, the path at the time and the derivative of the path at the time. And that's something that's a function only of the time, which I could take a derivative with respect to time of. So that fixes the type error. And you just, this is the correct answer. And it's explicit that the function Q is the path being tested and W and W dot are just formal parameters. That's something we get for being a programmer as we understand that of the Lagrangian, whatever that means, okay? And in modern functional notation, it looks pretty good. Okay, this is from Spivak type functional notation, transforms into scheme. So it's one-to-one -one correspondence. It's complete, unambiguous and executable. So for example, I can define a harmonic oscillator, which is the smallest, the, the only thing I can put on the slide that you could, that fits, okay? A harmonic oscillator, which is a, a mass MK, a spring constant K. So the spring mass system, get the Lagrange equations for it. For if I don't know what the, what the answer is, oh yes, it gives me the differential equation. This is the residual. And then, m times the second derivative of x, so md square x dt square uh, is, is minus kx, okay? Or if I put in a proposed solution, like it's a times the cosine of omega t plus phi, which is all solutions look like that. Yeah, well, I get the, I get something that must be zero. Therefore, this must be zero. Therefore, I find out that the, that the uh, angular frequency is the square root of k over m, okay? Right there, okay? So th th that's something that would work. But the important thing is that it's clear. It, I went from something which was unclear and takes a lot of time to think about to understand to something which is really clear and simple. As a program, it's, it's even clearer because it's absolutely unambiguous what these things mean. It doesn't depend upon, doesn't depend upon a big vocabulary of symbols. So I wanna make a summary. I'm almost done here, okay? Okay, and a summary of why programming is so much fun. It provides intellectual pleasures, okay? There's the discovery of analogies, like, and these may be deep and sense important analogies, like the vowel apply interpreter and Maxwell's equations, and other things that are dual variable systems, okay? There's the, the, the corresponding pleasure of philosophical contemplation, that every time you write a program, you encounter things that must, that, that have been thought about by, for, for thousands of years by philosophers, and you have to at least come to a sort of solution for your, at the moment, okay? Which may not be a giant solution, but if you think about it right, it's internal things that stimulate your mind, okay? There is the idea of debugging, okay? Which is, I believe bugs are, are essential to the way you think. If, because in order to do things, you have to simplify in order to make progress. And once you get into that mode, then of course you're going to have bugs and you've got to, you got to, you got, you got to hunt them down. And that's fun too, because it's like going after, it's got like hunting for, for something. Well, the worst bugs I've ever encountered were trying to figure out why a garbage collector went berserk in a, pro, in a system and cleared my memory. And that was pretty hard to solve, okay? But basically, you know, there's a, it's maybe a long process where you have to put in lots of breakpoints and you go chasing down and, and you're, you're, you're trying to reason out what's happening. And that's fun, okay? It's fun figuring out what happened, okay? The bad bugs are the ones that are due to the fact that, that you know, you made a syntax error or you, you misunderstood the way the language works or something like that, okay? 
But the other part here is that discovery of good ideas okay, is, is, is fun, and that happens when you're programming. So we, I gave an example of high order functions and extensible generic procedures simplifies automatic differentiation. Okay, but as a consequence, there was a pleasure of clarity that you can take a difficult subject like, like uh, classical mechanics, which is considered difficult, or general relativity, which is actually not very difficult except for the math being hard. Okay, and you can elucidate it by writing programs that make it easier to understand because they're unambiguous and don't depend upon context. Okay? So I want to conclude with the words that I think is very important. Happy hacking. And one more thing. Programming is really fun only if you could share your work with others. So please write and use free Libre software. I get very upset with the fact that I'm right now using Zoom, but that's because that's not free software. Okay. And there are free software things we could have used to run this meeting, but I'm not in charge of this meeting. Okay. So so I would like, I'm willing to use them only because I want to be able to tell you, I want you to use and, and write free, free software, where free means you can share it with your friends, okay? You want to know what this means, please look at this URL, and you should join and donate to the Free Software Foundation, which is the, the, the people who make things like, what we now call things like GNU Linux and things like that, okay? And that's it for me. Okay, I'm here to answer questions and <laughs> okay, I'm here to take Q&A. Okay, it's better now. Okay. Do you want to talk about the Sapir-Wolf hypothesis? Sapir-Wolf hypothesis for- Yeah, I know what that is, okay. Um, that's a claim that the language you speak determines the mm -hmm. concepts you can make, okay? And it has been discredited for very good reason. Okay. The reason why the reason why it doesn't make sense in human languages is because all human languages are capable of expressing anything any other human language can in re with reasonable efficiency. You know, if you look at human languages, every one of them is complicated, and there's but you think of it as a bump under the carpet. You can push it around anywhere you want. So the complexity might go from the grammar to the vocabulary to something else. Okay. But they're all probably pretty much the same, it turns out, for human languages. And then it's also true for computer languages. Every computer language is, is Turing universal. That's true. Okay. But the, the difference is that when we're dealing with computer languages, we're dealing with formal ideas, not informal. We're trying to make things that are very precise and explicit, okay? I think that it is not the case that you can't think the ideas in, say, C, okay, that you can think in, in scheme or, or, say, ML or something like that. But the difference is that they lead you to think differently. Just like if you're... If you know languages like European languages, say for example, French, okay, there it leads you to th when you think in French, which I do sometimes because I took four years of French in high school, it leads you to think differently. Doesn't mean that you can't think the same, okay, but you get led down different paths, okay. Or for example, Yiddish. Yiddish is a marvelous language for describing disasters. Okay, for humorously describing disasters, in fact. Okay, it's hard to find a language that, that's better for describing bad things happening. Okay, than Yiddish. Okay, and you pick you pick your language, um, and so I would pick. I if it's a question of what I'm trying to say, look, if I want to write a, a device driver, it's going to not going to be in Scheme, or in Python. Okay, it's going to be in it's going to be in something like C. And why? Because I can't, because because I, I really have to be able to get at the those memory locations and understand that. Okay. Uh, and I'd have to worry about the exact timing, maybe, of some I.O. device. On the other hand, uh, if I'm trying to think about something more abstract, like like the uh, the motion of the planets, damn it, I want to write it in something where I can be abstract. 
and it's harder to write in a, in a write abstract stuff in most languages than the, the languages that are easiest to write abstract stuff are things like C, scheme because scheme has the has the property that uh, that nothing is fixed that I'm allowed to change everything including the primitives or the or the and I can define new stuff easily in terms of old stuff now you know when you talk about python or something python is sort of a, a, step, a step in the right direction from from c uh what can i say so i want to be careful yes constraints lead to innovation okay but it's also the case and in fact we know that in real in real uh, in real art you know beethoven put lots of constraints on himself in order to write great music okay and Bach produced, produced great music with even more strict constraints. But the fact of the matter is that when you remove some of the constraints, other ones become apparent. One of the things I like about, about the Lisp-like world is I don't have to think about the difference between data and procedures. Okay? I have, a, I have an E. I can easily write programs that manipulate programs very easily. And that they can use, in other words, I can write a program that writes a program and then executes it. I'd easily do that. And that's something I can't do very well in most languages. Probably, there's a, John, by the way, did that answer your question, Sam? That was Sam Lipoff. Okay, I can't, without not hearing Sam, I'll proceed to look at John's stuff. Is programming equal to hacking? No, they're different activities. But hacking is, the way I'm thinking about hacking, okay, is it's a programming be, to, in order to, to emphasize the fun of it, okay? The, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the, the news media, unfortunately, assigned hacking to be the bad guys. We used to call those the crackers, the bad guys. And they were the hackers are the good guys. But what hacking, hacking, hacking meant you're doing it for the pleasure of it. Okay. It's also true that there are the times when you need to do produce produce something that works. Sure. And it might be that while doing that, you're also hacking because you're doing something that maybe have a useful value and also happens to be fun to do. Okay. There's an anonymous attendee here. Oh, by the way, John, did that answer your question? We can, um, I suppose we're not getting people to uh, unmute and say, uh, do I, oh, co-pilot. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I have to uh, give them permission to talk before they can unmute. Oh, I see. Okay. Can you give everybody permission to talk? Is that? Uh, I have to do it individually and we have 140 people. Oh, I see the problem. Okay. Yeah, I'm used to, I'm used to dealing with a classroom. <laughs> it was a very different I, thing. I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So I'll go. I'll continue. Copilot and similar systems shortens the time we have left to enjoy symbolic fun of programming. Uh, no. Okay. And there's a reason. The reason is because it must be very clear. The fact that computers can play chess better than me doesn't mean it isn't fun to play chess. How's that? Okay. The fact that 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 uh, that uh, that uh, I can hire a, uh, a machine to, to uh, dig a trench for me doesn't mean it isn't fun sometimes to dig a trench. Okay, so I want to be careful. I think the separating the, uh, the fun from the purpose of, it is often the case that, uh, that, when you, that if you have to get something done in a, with a limited amount of time, yes, or a limited amount of resources, yes, you might have to need things like that. But I'm a little worried about co Copilot anyway and things like that because to what extent is that violating people's copyrights? Okay, the people who wrote the code that the thing has is, is been trained on. I don't know. We have a lot of questions about that. And I'm sure that the legal system is going to get quite uh, in, inundated with that eventually. Uh, aren't bugs just separate serendipitous creative? Well, I'm not sure I know what that means. Serendipitous creative? Let, let, let me add a comment here. Uh, yes. Uh, there was. For some things like PostScript and interpreters, there was a standard, and then there were implementations that violated the standard but were widely used. Uh, for example, VAX Fortran was different from the standard for Fortran 
but there were people who wrote programs to the VAX or TRED as if it was its own standard and you needed to be compatible with that in order to be able to continue to run their programs or for PostScript interpreters and things like that. So uh, you get de facto standards that are whatever some widely used. That's right. That's, a, that's, a, a, that's certainly true. And it's, a, it's somewhat of a pain in the ass, actually. <laughs> yes, you would like it for people to at least um, to agree about lots of things that are that are important that when they're important but that's a very different um yeah but that, that well, uh, muddles what is a bug and what is a variation yeah i don't know how to answer that okay at all um but i think that the 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 the, the nice thing here oh someone's asking kai eichholz what is your most loved modern languages well, I personally like the lisps, all the lisps. Any lisp is better than none, okay? Uh, that puts me in a, in a rather, uh, a rather uh, isolated place in the world. Uh, on the other hand, I've programmed in almost everything, okay, at, at one time or another. Uh, I, I, I think that the reason why I like lisps so much is because the lisp is not telling me how to program. It's allowing, it's giving me the flexibility to reprogram in any way I choose. Okay. Is that a, an answer that you, you, you like, Kai? I like a lot of, of functional programming when I can. Okay. Functional, uh, but in other words, I write my Lisp in a functional style, mostly. The very, very rarely do I actually use assignments and side effects, but I do when necessary, when it, when it makes a big, a big difference in my, in, in what I can do, okay? Then there's Sanjit asked, what was MIT's CS building like in the 60s? What do you mean by that? It was a, if you really wanna know the emotional state of the, Ameri the, the, uh, the artificial intelligence lab, for example, which I was in, and the, uh, which was part of, the, part of the project Mac in the 60s, the, that building was that building was indeed contained Project Mac. You should read the book Hackers by what was his name? Oh, I lost his name. Does anybody remember the name of the, uh, uh, the the book? The name of the person who wrote the book Hackers. I have it here somewhere. Okay, let me look it up. I'm going to use a. <laughs> I'm going to do a search. I'll be right right back. Ah, by Stephen Levy, okay? There was a book Stephen Le by Stephen Le Levy. Although he got lots of the details wrong, including names of people and things like that, Stephen Levy got the, the captured the emotional state. And you should read that book. Okay, Sanjit? What do you think of Clojure, the JVM version of Lisp? Oh, it's nice. I like it. I think it's very, uh, I, I think it's very, um, very important. Uh, it makes it makes lists uh, inter work inter inter uh, working inter, work inter well that's the right word. It works correctly with with Java. The difficulty with it is that it, that it can't be tail recursive, and that means you can't use you can't uh, avoid having to introduce uh, iter iterative constructs that are actually easy to define as recursive objects. So it loses some of the, the elegance of something like Scheme, but it's not, uh, but, but otherwise it's a wonderful language. The, uh, the reason why the, it, it can't be tail recursive is because JVM, the JVM explicitly rules that out. Ah, oh, I see Gregory Martin, the names of progr in programs. Hi, Gregory. That's, uh, yes. Let's see. I actually think that naming is probably the hard, one of the hardest things that a programmer does. Because you have to come up with a name that's going to, you're going to remember a year from now. Okay? That you're going to remember what it means and why you... So what I tend to use is big, long names 
that are often like a little could, could almost be written as a paragraph <laughs> explaining what explaining what this this object is uh but that makes the makes things long and painful you know and sometimes some a bit wordy wordy uh i suppose pieces to name you choose the pieces of to name when a, a piece is going to occur more than once or when the name is go, is a, is going to remind you what does that piece is intended to be that's all uh, Dan Cross, mathematical technician should be part of the step forward. Sure is. Could it be fair to say that computer languages? Yes, I agree. Dan, you're I, I think you're right on. Uh, the the computer languages are a are in fact an advance over the traditional mathematical formalisms because mathematical formalisms are are actually pretty bad. They're they're historical and uh, and ca carry lots of bad ideas in them. So for example, I'll give you an example. Um, cosine square of x is cosine x times cosine x, right? Okay, but cosine to the minus one of x is not one over cosine x. It's inconsistent. That's because of our mathematical notations. How's that? Okay, I would like to see that fixed. I would like to see it so that we no longer depend upon historical nonsense that make it inconsistent. Uh, is that a good answer to you, Dan? Let's see. What is the best ratio for implementation for a software hardware algorithm? What do you mean? What is the best ratio for implementation? I don't know what that means. I, I don't know what the, that question means. Sorry. Okay. Then what do I the, then ten, Ted Peck says? What do you think of Chomsky's concept of merge being the fundamental unit of thought? I think it's too simplistic. There's not one fundamental unit of thought. I would imagine the things that happen by evolution are usually a pile of things. Okay, of which you, there are going to be many little pieces, each of which uh, is 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 essential to making good good thoughts okay it's the what happened look let's be very clear about this okay does the, your dog think sure it does it may not think as much as you do okay but your dog thinks it doesn't have merge it can't speak it doesn't have language okay however it certainly has a way of of uh, of it has a theory of mind it can it can empathize with you Okay, it can it can it knows how to deal with the social structure of among dogs. Okay, it has it has it thinks pretty well. It, it, it there's and most mammals think pretty well. Okay, I I don't think there are any that miss it. So I think that Chomsky's concept of merge is a is a de, de, he's definitely right that there's some a fundamental unit of of linguistic thought, and there may be more or symbolic thought. And there may be more, th I suspect there's going to be more things than that. There's not just one thing, but it can't be too many because after all, language only appeared 70,000 years ago. So it, it can't be too many com uh, complex changes. And uh, if, uh, there's one more, David Mankins asked, uh, Alan Kay described the eval applied to as maximum equation. Oh yes, that's wonderful. Yes, I didn't know that. Thank you. I'll remember that. But Alan Kay is generally right. When Alan Kay says something, he's right. <laughs> uh, yes. And I, I, APL is a rather wonderful language. Unfortunately, it, it couldn't be uh, typed on a standard typewriter. Okay. But it was full of great ideas. Who's Ken Friedman? Let me see where I, I, I just looked at. Thank you. Philosophical question. What do you think should be done to get more people programming, not coding? Seems like most people could be and should be programming to create a medium, but don't. What are the biggest barriers that we can fix? Uh, the biggest one is to not make it the same way we have trouble with mathematics. It's taught poorly. <laughs> okay, people are teaching programming as a, as a set of economically important skills rather than as a rather than as an expressive medium. That's what I think. Okay, if if we well, we don't do that with language. We one of the things we teach children at the beginning. Is to, uh, is to communicate with their neighbors for fun. 
Okay, and I think that's the the the, the right thing. Um, what do you worry about function theft by changing the precision or representation? I don't know what that means. Sorry, don't know how to answer that question. Does anybody know how to answer with to clarify that question? Sorry, I just, just like just doesn't parse. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, what about languages that have only numerics like one, two, and many? Uh, I don't think that I don't think that's real. Okay, we certainly have languages like that, but people have shown that the people who speak those languages can certainly can certainly think numerically. Okay, that's one of the. There's a lot of experiments like that, uh, and that. The idea that the language only has those kinds of words doesn't mean that the that the the thought the thought patterns in those that those people use don't contain numbers, okay. that, and basically mechanisms that allow inf an infinity to occur. Uh, let's see, I, I I can't give you the um, give you the reference right off the top of my head, but there are certainly papers showing that that that's true, and I've read them. Uh, Sam Burry, a theoretical physicist would not enjoy exploring. Well, I don't see why you would think that, Sam. Uh, that a theoretical physics would not enjoy exploring conceptual space under my programming language-based regime. Look, I was very good friends with uh, with with Richard Feynman. Okay, I taught a class with him for for a year. Okay, at Caltech in 1983. Okay. Feynman enjoyed programming. I taught him a little uh, some scheme, and he spent uh, he, he he stayed up all night one night uh, writing a, a a thing for doing power series stuff just for fun. Okay, so this is it doesn't I don't think that I don't you're talking about maybe some particular theoretical physicist would not enjoy, and some other ones would. The really important thing is is that the scribbling on the paper pad I do that too. Okay, I enjoy that too. You use both. If I had a choice of languages, this is Ed Friedman uh, for updated SISP. You've identified inconsistencies in Python. Why did you choose JavaScript? Okay, I didn't choose JavaScript. Okay, this was done. the The SICP, uh, the SICP thing here. Okay, the that's the JavaScript edition was done uh, by Tobias and Martin Hentz with my with help by my wife Julie. Okay, I actually had very little to do with it except helping them debug some of the some of the stuff having to do with the compilers in Chapter Five. Okay, um, to me, the right words are. I don't much like it. Okay, you know, it's good for the world because there are some ideas in SICP that are important for people to learn, and by golly, putting it in JavaScript makes it a little more accessible. On the other hand, uh, it's much more complicated. And it, certain things become very complicated, like the, the query language and the, the compilers and interpreter stuff, okay, are much, much more complicated. So the way I think about it is this is like um, putting 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 ketchup on caviar. How's that? Okay. I think SICP was good enough as it is, but it does, didn't have a large range of people adopting it. Uh, yeah, apparently, terrific. Martin Hens was using this to teach a course yes. in Singapore for a number of years. Did, did you get any feedback from how that went using applying these techniques? Yes, it works fine, and he's he, and he's and he's, he's an incredibly good teacher, and he's got a beautiful support system for for doing this stuff. Okay, at, at Singapore. Okay. And uh, I I love what he did. Okay. I just personally feel that that I to me, SICP at second edition was good enough. You know, I I and once you put once you do this other thing, it makes it complicated in many ways. JavaScript has a bunch of problems, like for example, there's no explicit quotation of uh, the, of uh, there's no explicit list notation, list notation. Okay, there's no explicit symbols. Okay. 
And that makes it much harder to write even simple programs. Okay, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, uh, I can't pronounce your name, Z, Z Shu. Okay, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce your name. I wish I could. But you ask, what is it? Well, I think about it, certifiable programming, automatic theorem improving area, et cetera. Yes, I think it's a good thing when it can be done. Okay, the difficulty is that you have to have a good specification. And I pointed out that most things don't have good specifications. In fact, you don't know what the specifications are until after you've tried to make something they see what you can actually build. Okay. So how would you ever specify, say, a text editor or a, or, a, or a word processor system? You don't specify that. You could make specifications of things you want it not to do. Okay, You can make a specification, Emacs. Emacs will not delete a file unless you, you really want it to. Okay? It will always write out the new version and, and close that version before it, it renames the, the it renames it the versions. Okay, yes, that's a specification of a detail, but a specification of the big thing, it's too hard. Nobody and you wouldn't know because you're going to change that specification every five minutes. Every real uh, application, the specification is changing faster than the uh, than 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 the time it would take to write just write them down. Okay, because the world the world changes and the timing changes. You, there are things that you can specify. You can specify things like a compiler because a compiler has a very specific input language which is specified and output language is specified. Okay, but but things that are more that are more uh, dependent upon upon what the application is can't be so specified. Um, William Owens asks. As a recent graduate, it feels more and more programming in the current year tends toward a lot of JavaScript frameworks and using non-free web APs, APIs, yes. Largely procedural, leads you're thinking towards large, clunky, proprietary systems to promote more hacker-friendly languages and abstractions. If so, how? Yes, I agree we should. I don't know how. <laughs> but I think it'd be very nice to, to... One thing I care about is I want people to be able to cooperate. Cooperation is critical. Uh, what do you think of JavaScript as a problem child, child of scheme? Oh, hi, Bob. Uh, well, it turns out that JavaScript was invented by the person who really wanted to write a scheme, but his boss said he couldn't. Okay, so I, I don't know the details of that, but that was what somebody told me. In fact, I think Martin Hintz told me that. Um, what are your thoughts on type systems? Oh, that's interesting. I like type systems. I don't like type systems that enforce enforce things on me. I don't want the type system to tell me I can't do something, but I want the type system to give me information, okay, to, I like type inference to, to, to be done. And I would like the type, a, a machine that gives me useful information as I'm programming saying, oh, you know, here's what types you seem to be, to, to, to be using here. Here's, the, here's the, uh, the consequences of that. Gee, there seems to be an inconsistency. I'd like that to be, be, be advisory. I don't want some damn compiler to say, you can't do that. <laughs> okay, actually, that's my business. If I want to screw myself, it's my business. Okay. Have you ever worked with Noam Chomsky on using programming to solve pro programs? There's no choice word. Chomsky's work is relevant. I have not worked with Noam Chomsky. I have spent some time working with a friend of his, who is a very good friend of his, Holly. Okay, Holly. Uh, but I, on we thought a bit, a bit about uh, about the. Um, I suppose it was about reduplication in languages and how you could write uh, how you could write an algorithm that describes how the reduplication happens. And things like, uh, you know, reduplication is sort of a, 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 a common thing in, in many languages. Okay, so I'm not going to I'm not going to get into that in detail. But uh, yes, I think what the right way to say it is programming can help people who are thinking linguistically about linguistics. Do you think there'll ever be a successful programming language? Unlike, yes. The answer is I have no idea. There's a famous. I don't remember this. Who I'm quoting. But there was a, a 
case where, what was it? Someone asked a famous computer scientist, what will the language, this is many say way back in the, in the 60s. He says, what will the language of the future, the best, the great language of the future be called? Be, be like, sorry, be like. And the famous person answered, uh, it will be, I don't know what it'll be like, what it'll be called Fortran. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, oh, Mr. Lipoff, hi, thank you for, uh, re, uh, for having taken my physics class. Um, okay. Jason Lynch. Okay, what is this? However, detail can become, the, I agree that there is power and beauty in detail and precision, and programming is a way to force high level precision in our mathematical statements, correct? However, detail can become tedious and ambiguity can be beautiful when it allows for different style, for different styles of comparison. What are your thoughts on balancing these tools? Okay, we'll be very clear about it, Jason. First of all, it doesn't require more detail to be unambiguous. Okay, that was one thing. For example, as I said, the notations invented in, in, in modern, modern calculus, like, like the ones I showed out from, from um, Spivak's book and I use in, in my, my, my uh, physics book, okay? Those are, those are not any larger or more complicated or more tedious or more detailed than, than the, the traditional notations. What they are is unambiguous, okay? And ambiguity is wonderful when you want to say something which you, which you, you intend ambiguity. But when you're trying to explain something like how uh, Lagrange's equations are, you know, are uh, describing the possible paths that a system may take, you don't want that to be ambiguous. You want that to be clear. You want to be, you don't want there to be, that, especially when you're teaching people who've never seen that before, because the ambiguity becomes, becomes a, a stumbling block. So I want to use, I want to use programming as a way of forcing unambiguous expression without making it more detailed, more tedious. Okay. Okay. So do I use Copilot? No, I haven't used Copilot or any other AI programming tools. I like to do it myself. Um, it's but, but another thing to point out is it's often the case that it's easier to write a program than to read the documentation for one that you could use. <laughs> so what can, sometimes if I need to get something done, then somebody might say, hey, you know, you could get so-and-so to do it for you. And I say, oh yeah, but I have to read that man page to do that. Guess what? I could write the program faster than reading the man page. <laughs> so, uh, what about drawing the line between pushing for great code versus great getting features cranked out as a production environment? Few things are as permanent as a temporary solution that works. I agree. Have you played with Rust recently? I haven't, but I hear it's very good. Okay, and I agree with you. Okay, uh, aside from scheme list, what's the next most fun language you've used? Oh, the next most fun? Let's see. Assembly language, actually. Okay. And the reason why is because I get to touch the machine. Okay. And the reason why is also unlike the other languages, but more like Lisp and Scheme, I can write a program that can write a program and then execute it. I can write code in front of the, my, my current program counter. Okay, and when the program kind of gets to it, <laughs> it uh, it'll execute. Okay, so it's a it's a it's got the the flavor of mixing data and procedure that I like. Okay, uh, let's see where did I just lose this? I just lost the current. Oh, I see. My pointer here is okay. Okay, here's um. I think there were yes. not a nice person was asking about the propagator model. Oh, I'm looking for that here. Where do I find the prop? I, unfortunately, my I lost my place in the. 
something uh, happened and I and I uh, I'm uh, what, what I, you know, who's, the, who, who's the person I was up to? I Does the propaganda matter? I'm sorry. Where's it? Where's this? Uh, if you go to 804 or 805 in the timing list, you'll find an anonymous question about the propagator model. Ah, ah, okay. Thank you for the. I just lost the the place. Okay, 808, 807, 807, 807, 807. Boy, there's a lot of questions here. 806, 806. Uh, 805. Is the propagator model by Radul and Sussman a more generalized model of the actor model? Well, it's not intended to be the same problem. Okay. Uh, do you think we'll see this model used in blockchain systems for the future, similar to how Definity's ICP is you trying to use the actor model? I don't know. Okay. The propagator model is trying to capture a particular way that I think about electrical circuits, for example. Okay. That's how it originally occurred. Um, I learned that by, by watching really good uh, people who do, uh, do analysis do it in their heads. Uh, exactly what, uh, whether or not this is, I don't, much, I don't think it's a generalized model of the, it's not a more generalized version of the actor model because the actor model is about, is about concurrency and specifically about, about, about cues on the inputs uh, of things and stuff like that. So I don't know is the answer. I don't think of it that way. Okay, I think of it more like constraint pro uh, constraint programming. Okay, let's see the next thing here. Ah, there's something going on with my. I understand. I understand why I'm screwing up. Yes, Stephen Levy. Thank you, people, for answering the question there. Okay, yes, Stephen Levy was the right person. Uh, how would you recommend teaching children how to program? Would you recommend buying them an old CRS-80 or teach them a modern language or a modern system? I don't know. The ex real expert on this would be someone like Hal Abelson, okay? My buddy in the next office. Uh, he would probably suggest that something like, something like Scratch, Okay, which is of course what the act, what his his um, his uh, app inventor system is based on. Okay, meaning a graphical thing is appropriate for little children. Okay, and give them real uh, real applications like making uh, applications for for your you know smartphones and things like that. Okay, but I don't really know. I haven't thought about little children. I'm not an expert there. Eric Fletcher asked, do you see a looming crisis, the number of systems written using older languages, a diminishing pipeline of younger folks learning? No, I don't worry about that. That's um, hard to say. Uh, those languages are going to be around no matter what anyway. Okay. Hi, Keith. Yes. Um, let's see. Schroeder. What's my opinion of fourth? Fourth is a great language. It's the same as PostScript. It's the same as Hewlett Packard uh, reverse Polish notation uh, calculator language. I love it. My, I have, a, I, have a, I always carry with me a, a Hewlett Packard calculator, a real one. Okay, I have one from the 1980s, and it's it, it goes with me wherever I go. It's part of my it's part of my uh, my uh, my pen collection. Think of it that way. Uh, okay, hi Henry. Uh, what's your opinion of current directions being taken by AI and deep learning? Oh my. Um, deep learning is basically basically solving the problems you can solve by function approximation with enough data. Okay, it's not the same as being smart. Uh, there is a famous book written way back in the fifties. Uh, see it off my shelf by the Gestalt psychologist Wertheimer, which I tell people to look at, okay? Here, this is the book, okay? It's called Productive Thinking by Wertheimer, 1959, okay? And this book had the, as the feature that approximately in chapter two, he shows that, real, that really the kind of thinking people do in solving problems is not either 
purely symbolic manipulation like like logic or algebra or let me see I'll close the door here okay it's neither it's neither that nor a, a sequence of associations which is what you would get by generalizing generalizing the function approximation view of the world um i think that yes deep learning is very valuable for making products that are useful and and probably profitable and ai of that kind is going to be running for a while it's going to be the dominant thing for a while but to me i'm more interested in understanding how thinking works how how real people think like how we do okay and and i i think that's going to take something which is neither pure pure symbolic or pure um pure function approximation what do you think of Russ as a replacement for C? I don't know. The answer is probably uh, uh, anything would be better than C. <laughs> I, the, uh, the, considering the number of bugs that that, that we have to the bugs that are bad ones that we have to exercise from C code. Yeah, you know, I just don't want. I don't want to see another memory a memory uh, misallocation. Yeah. You know. <laughs> bug in the, again would you say programming oh, manu says would you say programming falls under a different type a different or new paradigm language something extended from mathematics yes and no if, if not if, if we could generalize the concept of mathematics to include programming okay and i think it will but i think right now the way to say it is that most of mathematics is about describing stuff descriptive it's how to it's not, sorry how, it's how it's what is so for example it's uh, if you look at point set topology okay what you're seeing is what it means to be near a near b okay and so it's a descriptive thing programming describe is allows you to say things that are more how to okay and there's very little like that uh you know in mathematics there's, if you look at the, the how-to is always written as a written as text in English in a mathematics book. It's not it's not explicitly said as as specific algorithms. Uh, when Trees asks, is there another use for naming, especially to tell stories, playing something in the program? Probably so, Win. But I we should talk about that. I want to talk to you about that sometime. All right, and here's anonymous attendee. Our justification-based truth payment system is the most powerful type of TMS. Uh, oh, uh, I don't know if they're the most powerful type. Uh, what made them the right choice for the propagated model? I would say the right answer is because it was easy for me to generate, do that. How's that? Okay. And um, here's Gremio. Uh, Gremio Martins, that's another thing. Please, oh, that's sorry. Okay, got that. Uh, DJ Vire, how programming paradigms change over time? I don't know, but they certainly have changed a lot in the past. It's hard to predict. It makes it hard to make predictions, especially in the future. Is anybody teaching your book structure interpretation of classical mechanics? Oh, yes, I, there, I know many places that the people are, uh, but I don't know, I, I can't spout them out right now to you. Um, Amber Brodsky. Programming has given us glimpses of engineering insight to many philosophical questions, but emotions and concepts of selfhood seem notably absent. Really? Maybe because we don't understand. Yes, I think there are opportunities here, Amber. Uh, wow, that's a really interesting question. We should talk about that. The... Selfhood. See, I like to think of this is this connects to the people. A lot of people worry about the concept of consciousness a lot. Okay, and they worry about whether or not what you mean by conscious. Um, and I think that's a funny statement. The laptop I'm talking to you on right now, I believe, is quite conscious. It's just dumb. Okay, well, if what I mean by conscious is it understands. A lot of its internal state, it can it mo monitors it, it uh, it reports on it, 
It complains when it's when it's broken. You know, you can hear a kvetch. Okay, it, it's an oh, my disc hurts. Okay, and things like that. Okay, so it it is conscious, and it can and it it it, it responds to its environment and all that. I think that's is best what I think. I think it has a concept of selfhood. Okay, but I think and I think that's not a problem. The real problem is what you mean by emotion, and I don't know. Maybe the concept, oh, my disc disc hurts, is already emotion. Okay, I don't know. Uh, but we should certainly think about that. Yes, there are opportunities here, because because you want your machines to have drives, things that that motivate them to do the things you want them to do. And that's not just giving them power from the power outlet. But let's talk about it. Okay, that's something we should talk about in the future. Uh, Roman Budzinski asked, Budza, sorry, Budzianowski, Budzianowski. Have you heard of Dylan? Yes. This versus Pascal syntax. Yep, pretty good. Okay, unfortunately it didn't make it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it was a pretty good, pretty good try. Um, MIT Press, by the way, also what? Alexander, I don't know, what the, that's not a question. What does teaching mathematics and programming well look like? Whew. That's a too long a story to, we should talk about that offline, Jason. Why don't you contact me and we'll have a discussion. Maybe, you, maybe we can have a long talk about that. I think it's very important, okay? We have, we have to fix the way teaching mathematics is done in the world. I don't know how the main problems with it, are, I believe, are, are mostly that the school systems are political and therefore you can't change very much. How do you propose readers to find solution for get hourity and, and other schemes in my scheme? The only scheme that supports get, eh, just, we can just fix that. That's not so hard. Okay. And now there's, you know, that's technical detail. What are your thoughts on unit testing? Oh, great idea. It's important. You have to do it. Yes, unit testing is a very important, very important uh, uh, way of, of avoiding ugly things that do to the, uh, the changes, both specification change and, and uh, short, small program changes. I do a lot of unit testing. Now, Melissa Chen, how can I, as someone who has been programming for several years, somewhat in, intimidated by it? as an entity, start to see as a creative medium. Wow. Okay, again, Melissa, that's too long a story and we should get the, why don't you contact me separately and we can talk about that. Um, I don't think you should be intimidated by anything. It's very important not to be frightened. The most important thing is to, see, is to, is to, is to do little things and enjoy doing them and see how as you as you grow that that you can get more and more power okay but i don't uh i think that's not something that can be short a short discussion yes hi bob i agree <laughs> does the propagating model allow for infinite scalability which eventually it did in one of the oc Yes, I, I yes it does, but I, I I don't know how to address your question, anonymous attendee. What do you think about skip lists versus binary trees? I don't know. That's a depends upon the it depends upon what I'm doing. I don't even worry about the algorithms very much. I first worry about what what problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, given a particular problem, one of them might be better than the other, but I haven't thought about that. Um, how do you reconcile the fact that the scheme is much less elegant readable than clean math expressions? I'm not sure I agree with you. I tend to write things both ways, okay? Uh, with very good mathematical expression language, like the one in, 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 from, from Spivak, I, I, I tend to use it quite a bit. I don't like Leibniz notation, that's the Dibody, Dibody notation, that causes lots of trouble. Uh, if you look at page, 41 in Spivak, I think. You will see he has a, he ra rails again. He has a a um, a giant uh, uh, a giant flame about that. Okay, Spivak's calculus on manifolds. Okay, uh, but I, I I don't think they're I, they're not 
they're not one neither is more or less elegant or readable than the other the difference is whether you like prefix notation or, or, or infix notation i tend to not like infix notation because you can't line up the arguments on large in in large uh, expressions whereas in prefix notation you have pretty printing makes it work out very nicely what's the name again of your second program assembly language is what i said okay <laughs> asm jim jim Moy figured that out, and the reason is because it, I actually it feels like it's more, it's got the it's got the power and the flexibility. How can one tune thought processes until it matches ARM all do? I don't know. <laughs> what uh, advice would you give to a professional software engineer used to find programming fun does find it anymore? I think change your job. <laughs> yeah, be 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 more aggressive toward your boss. Tell, get them, tell them where to get off. Uh, isn't splitting a small part of this one can apply to my full power to each sub job once. Actually, I don't agree with that, Shamil. Shaimal Chandra. I don't think that that's how things work. I mean, basically what we're talking about here is the guy, the guy, the, the idea of recursion. Yeah. The idea of taking a complex problem, breaking it into parts, work on the parts separately, and then combine the, the pieces to make, make the solution to the whole. Okay, and that's, that's the, a very fundamental, what's called divide and conquer algorithm for, or, or method for solving a very hard problems. All very hard problems are, 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 should be attacked that way. There's no other way, really. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael Travis, any thought on programming environments? I don't know. Uh, my favorite programming environment is Emacs. Okay. Uh, what, what, changes would you make? what changes do you make to your code before you share it? For example, a code review or before a release. I re make sure the names make sense, okay? That a person reading the code can figure out what the, what the code does Okay, by looking at the names of the variables and the and the procedures. Okay, I also I also uh, I also uh, put in lots of comments. Minsky once mentioned in his OCW lecture that I, that you, uh, your PhD uh, come. Oh, it's good. One of the most original he ever read is is it still getting to read, explored her. Yes, I think it is. I think it is a good area of research to focus on on how people think about and debug programs. Yes, I think it is. Uh, it would help if you read the complete question as the, oh, I thought, I thought people, everybody could see these questions. I'm sorry. Sorry, Paul Kennedy. I thought that these were, these were available to everybody. Okay, why do I not like C? Okay, go look at the, uh, go look at this, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, set of, Every, every few weeks, I get a new Linux kernel, or every few days, okay? Usually, it's because there are some, there are some exploit that is possible because of some memory error or something, okay? That's why I don't like C, okay? It's because people are lured into making bad code. <laughs> C, is a, C is a bug trap. How's that? End of story. Okay, I think I've answered all the questions I could. And the fellows I can't, sorry, I'm, I, I'm perfectly happy to talk as long as you want. And if you want to come by and visit me sometime, and if you happen to be around, I may make you a pot of tea. How's that? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I want to say a few words if you're done answering questions. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank everyone for sticking around this long. We have close to 100 people hanging in there through your close to 100 questions. Uh, I want to invite people to come to our next meeting if they've hung around uh, this long. They probably are going to be interested in that. But we're going to take a slightly different tack uh, next month. Go ahead, pull that. Okay. Can you see I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, okay. Dick Seitz, who was the uh, main, one of the main architects of the 
deck alpha architecture yep. has in recent years been studying performance in large distributed systems. And he's going to be addressing a somewhat different issue. I think when you were talking about programming today, you were talking mostly in a single threaded kind of way. But what Dick is going to talk about is how systems perform in a very multi-threaded environment where they're contending for resources with other things going on in the system, including other programs, and how that can lead to variation in performance from the best performance you would get on a dedicated computer and to give you techniques and tools for uh, tracing that down. He was doing a lot of consulting for Google and Adobe and Tesla and other companies like that who have to deal with very complex environments. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, uh, come to our uh, webinar next month. So that's that's my it's advertisement for what we're continuing. Sounds to very do. interesting. And I'd like to thank Jerry again for uh, what was also a very interesting talk and gave us a lot of insights <laughs> into how to program and how to design programming languages and how to uh, use programming to explore the universe. And the most important thing is to have fun, please. Keep it fun. Well, exploring the universe is always a lot of fun. Well, if no one has anything more to say, and I guess because I didn't unmute everybody, I don't think people are going to have much more to say. I'm going to try to put this talk uh, up either as on demand or on our website for people to uh, look at further or for people who had missed it. So thanks, everybody. And with that, I guess I'm going to end the meeting. Bye. Bye.